Hi, everyone. Welcome to Gruff Talk, where each week we explore everything to help us feel better, look better, live better, and age better. I'm your host, Barbara Hannah Grufferman. You all are regular readers of Menopause Cheat Sheet, a free newsletter we publish that helps women navigate life before, during, and after menopause with the latest research, tips, and lots of encouragement, right? But if you're not, you can learn more by going to menopausecheatsheet.com and subscribe. And here's the best thing. Not only do we give you all the information you need, we also answer your questions. But wait, there's more. Every month, we take a question from our audience and answer it right here on Gruff Talk. Joining me for the monthly Menopause Cheat Sheet is the co-founder and medical director of Menopause Cheat Sheet, Dr. Margaret Noctegal. Dr. Margaret is a reproductive endocrinologist and clinical associate professor in the Department of OBGYN, Division of Reproductive Endocrinology at NYU Langone Health, and has been in practice for over 25 years. And I think I've known Dr. Margaret for most of those 25 years. Hello, Dr. Margaret. Hello. Thank you for having me. Oh, please. This is a regular thing. And we love to talk. and We love to answer our readers' questions and our viewers' questions. So this is really great. And nothing makes us happier than getting to those questions. So here is one that's come in, actually comes in quite a lot, as you know, and I think will resonate with a lot of women out there. Here it is. So vaginal dryness was an issue for me when I was in perimenopause, the years leading up to menopause. Now that I am postmenopausal, it has gotten worse and I'm really suffering. What should I do? Dr. Margaret? This is a really, really good question because vaginal dryness only gets worse as menopause continues unless it's treated. And so this is really not a surprise that it's getting worse. And I really believe that no one should have to suffer with vaginal dryness. It's a really, really important topic. The symptoms for those people who aren't sure if they do have dryness or they don't have dryness, but the symptoms are typically a feeling of either itching or burning. Sometimes people will describe it as their vagina feels like sandpaper. Mm -hmm. Some people only experience the fact that it's uh, painful for them to have any type of sexual activity or intercourse. And for everyone, it's a little bit different. But the reason that this gets worse is because in menopause, estrogen levels become very, very low. And estrogen maintains the collagen in skin, which allows the skin in the rest of the body as well as the vagina to have its thickness and its elasticity. So the estrogen levels get lower. That means there's a lot less collagen. And collagen maintains the acid environment in the epithelium or the outside of the vagina. It helps the vagina stay moist and it allows for more blood flow to take place. So when estrogen is not around, that means there's less moisture, less blood flow, a lot more dryness and lack of that stretching that the vagina is usually so good for. In addition, not only that, but the pH, which is how acidic or basic the vagina is, normally when estrogen is around, it's more in the acidic category. It's less than a number five. And that low pH helps keep infection away. When menopause occurs and estrogen levels go down, the pH goes up. And when the pH is increased, unfortunately, that means that more infection can be introduced. So not only is it uncomfortable to have vaginal dryness, but it actually can be unsafe in that it can allow for infections that normally wouldn't bother someone to really come into fruition. Right. I want to get back to one thing that you were talking about before, about the collagen. Sure. See, I think that women don't really think of their vaginas in the skin category. You know, like what's what's happening right. with their skin also, like their facial skin, their body skin is also happening to their the skin 
around and in their vagina during all of this. Absolutely. Right? So you mentioned right, collagen right, right. and we know how important collagen is. We th- And we think of collagen normally with regards to facial skin and making our skin look better, right? And many people take, and and I'm one of them, take collagen protein peptides. Like I take a scoop of the powder in my coffee and they say it's good for cartilage, you know, for your cartilage, uh, keeping that steady and, and maintaining the density, but also for your skin, your nails, your hair. Is this something that you ever discuss with your patients for keeping their Vaginas also healthy with collagen? I actually, no, no, actually, I have not. And I really don't usually talk about adding collagen to the diet. But I do talk a lot about other things that we can do to keep the vagina healthy. So maybe that's a topic for another day to investigate. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things that women can do to keep their vaginas healthy and they can have, you know, continue to have a nice active sex life and sex isn't painful? What can they do? What are some of the treatments and options? Well, I think as I break it down, I break it down into those products that are prescription versus Mm non-prescription. For the prescription ones, most people can actually take a vaginal estrogen. And and I want to make the point that a vaginal estrogen is different from estrogen that you might be taking all over the body. So in other words, not by mouth, not in a patch, but just something administered vaginally, either with vaginal tablets or suppositories or a cream. And this is local. It's just affecting the vagina. It's not going to get to the rest of the body. So it's not so systemic in a, in a people, medical Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. And so the vaginal estrogen can be taken by just about anyone. There are people who have very positive estrogen receptors, tumors, such as a breast cancer that has a lot of estrogen receptors. And in that case, if an individual actually has that, they may not be candidates to take vaginal estrogen. But unless they have an estrogen-sensitive tumor, pretty much anyone can take vaginal estrogen. And the vaginal estrogen restores the epithelium or the lining of the vagina back to where it was in the premenopausal state. It lowers the pH and it allows for that stretchiness to come back and it decreases the infections that can come in. So that's a great option for some people, but not everyone wants to take vaginal estrogen. And, And again, some people are not candidates to take it. And for those people, there are some other options. There are vaginal moisturizers, there are vaginal lubricants, and then there are agents that actually lower the pH. So the ones that lower the pH, I usually recommend hyaluronic acid. And there are different products that are available that people can get that will replace and put that, you can do intermittently, say three days a week, four days a week, even two days a week that can really, really make a difference. And those are great. And then in addition to those, people can use vaginal moisturizers. Now, those are not going to necessarily bring the vagina back to where it was, but it's going to increase the moisture. Mm -hmm. And that is often really helpful. Some of the moisturizers will also lower the pH, not all of them, but many of them. And then another thing that can be really helpful are different kinds of natural oils that can improve the moisture in the vagina. So some of them are just a a regular coconut oil, and that can be really helpful and soothing. I have friends, girlfriends who swear by coconut oil, literally all over their body, their hair, you know, their skin, and also in their vaginas. Mm -hmm, Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. No, it really makes a difference. And it's, it's easy to use. You can try to get the one that's not scented so that it doesn't smell like coconuts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that, you know, is really... And then in addition, there are local ointments that you can use externally that can be really helpful. Some of the same ointments that we use for diaper rash are really good for postmenopausal women. That is really, really helpful just to cover. And then there are the lubricants. Now, the lubricants I usually recommend during sexual activity, not necessarily just to use 
throughout the day. Although I do have some patients that have told me that they like it regardless of whether there is sexual activity or not. And there are many different types of vaginal lubricants. There are the water-based products, Mm -hmm. there are the silicone-based products, and then there are the natural oils as in the coconut oil and the almond oil. And there's also saliva, which some people find very beneficial during intercourse. So interesting. That's another option. But that's specifically yes. during intercourse. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for... Ex- well, yes, or any... Any sexual any, activity. You know, particular right. Activity. Right, right. And, you know, throughout those, there are different brands that are over the counter that people can buy. Are there any that you would recommend to our listeners? Sure. I mean, for the hyaluronic acid, I really like a brand called Reverie, Mm -hmm. which are suppositories. There's another one called Hyalo GYN, which is more of a cream based. Those are both over the counter for moisturizers. Replens is Mm -hmm. one brand that I use some oils. There's KY Silk. There's, Mm -hmm. as I said, the natural oils. In terms of the -the over-the-counter lubricants, I have gotten recommendations from patients as well as Astroglide, KY Jelly. There's an organic Good Clean Love. There's Aloe. There's um, one called Squid. There's one called Aqua Gel, Astroglide, Lavina. Mm-hmm. Oh, the there's so many one, options out there. Pink, More than ever before. Uber Lube <laughs> is another Uber one. Uber Lube, I like that. Uber Lube. <laughs> Astroglide makes a couple of different ones. Those are very popular. Actually, it's an interesting story. I think it was originally made to help astronauts get into their suits. It's so and, uh, funny. So interesting. Yes. It's glide so, right in. You know how some of these things, <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. But um, but you do recommend, there are a lot of, clearly a lot of options for over-the-counter, which does make life easy. Uh, and the over-the-counter can be used in conjunction with some vaginal estrogen. Right. And sometimes that's really helpful. And then there there is an oral prescription medication that also can be really helpful for the right individual. And there is a another product that is neither estrogen nor over the counter. There's a prescription DHEA, which is sold under the brand name of Interosa, which can be used daily that also once that is the DHEA is in the vagina, it converts into estrogen and can also be helpful for reducing the symptoms of vaginal dryness. But many, many options, which is great news because as you and I always say in menopause, Chichi, we don't want any woman to suffer. Why should any woman suffer when there are so many options? For this, particularly, particularly in this area. And, and it can it's make treatable. such a big difference. Such a big difference. I have so many patients that have really been so appreciative because vaginal dryness is going to happen to just about everyone if we don't treat it. And just about every person who has a vagina without estrogen will end up with some vaginal dryness. And so it just makes so much sense to try to fix it. Mm -hmm. If someone is on HT, on on systemic hormone therapy, I just want to be clear about that with everyone listening, is this really, is their vaginal dryness and vaginal issues really resolved with HT or will they also need to do some of these other options? It really, really depends on the person. Mm -hmm. In some patients, just the systemic alone is all they need and there's no evidence of vaginal dryness. And in other patients, they will be, you know, maybe they're on a very low dose of systemic hormone therapy and they need a little bit of something vaginally, whether it's a hyaluronic acid or a vaginal estrogen Mm -hmm. is, you know, by person to person. And you know, one thing I didn't even mention is there are some people that prefer to do laser treatments for vaginal dryness. It's expensive, but doable. And does it really um, work? And has some does it very, really yes, work? It it actually yeah. has some very nice effects. Yes, mm-hmm. it uh, it really does, and that can be done also in combination with other products, whether the over the counter option or vaginal estrogen. And mm-hmm. you know, the nice thing about it, vaginal estrogen is you can use super, super, super low doses, 
you know, there's the vaginal tablets could be used only twice a week, sometimes even once a week. Mm -hmm. The suppository is the same thing. There's a ring that people can insert themselves that secretes a tiny, tiny amount of estrogen every single day. And every three months, you change the ring. So that's another option. Some of the creams are really, really beneficial. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, as we always say, it's a really good idea to try to get some treatment so that you're not suffering. And it's okay to try a lot of different products. Right. It's okay if the first one doesn't work for you. That's all right. Let's just try another one. And maybe you need two together to make it work. And no two people are exactly the same. So what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for someone else, but you might find something that works fantastically for you. So I think it's just don't give up, keep trying. And of course, you know, it's great to see a healthcare provider that can help you and guide you in making some of these decisions and choices and see what's right for you. Right, because personalized medicine really, especially in this case, is so critical, right? So for getting critical. the right Absolutely. for getting the right treatment. For me, Always. for me, when I went through menopause and then I was really done just about age 50, and I was uh put on, I never took the systemic HT. Uh, in my case, my symptoms really weren't all that terrible, but vaginal dryness was. And so I was put on a suppository tablet that I continue to use now. 15 years later, it continues to work. And I use that in conjunction with some of the over-the-counter products that you mentioned. And, you know, so I have found my perfect cocktail, (laughs) if you will, and it's working for me, but with the guidance of my doctor. You see, that's critical, everyone, is that, you know, as Dr. Margaret is always saying whenever she gives a talk or, you know, is writing a menopause cheat sheet. And right now, really start with that conversation in partnership with your trusted healthcare provider. And if you don't have one, right, if you don't have a menopause specialist, you can go to, right, NAMS, the uh, National Menopause Society, and uh, their website is menopause.org. And they have a section that lists doctors that specialize in menopause and midlife women's uh, health care. So Absolutely. I think great, that's a great that's place good to- advice. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we'll fill you in. There's a new study that's come out and been making the rounds in all the media. We're intrigued by it. And uh, let's talk about it to see how it might be affecting you right after this short break. Okay, everyone, we're back with Dr. Margaret Noctegal, Medical Director of Menopause Cheat Sheet. Dr. Margaret, okay. The good news, I think, is that women in midlife are, and beyond, can have a great sex life, continue to have a great sex life, especially if they take care of their vaginas, as we've been discussing. But the not such great news is that according to an article in the Washington Post and a lot of other media this week, the number of cases of some sexually transmitted diseases, STDs, increased during the first year of the pandemic, continuing a rise seen over the last decade. Specifically, syphilis and gonorrhea cases increased in 2020 as screening clinics closed because of the pandemic, and then people put off their regular doctor visits. This was all from an annual report published by the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And not only is this true for all ages, but there was another study out not that long ago, I want to say in the last year or so, that showed that people in midlife specifically have been showing a dramatic rise, an increase in STDs. I mean, my theory is because they think, oh, well, I've gone through menopause. I don't have to worry anymore. Therefore, I don't need to be careful. I think that might have something to do with it. So what's your advice to everyone listening in about how to have great sex, but safe sex? I I mean, I think the word there is safe. Absolutely. So for one thing, I absolutely think that people should get screened. There's no reason not to have a test to see if you or your partner or the person that you're going to be intimate with has any type of an infection, a sexually transmitted infection, an STI, any infection. 
So that's one thing. The other thing is, I'm glad you brought this up because one thing that I should mention is the symptoms of vaginal dryness can really overlap with the symptoms of an infection. So not even a sexually transmitted infection, maybe just a regular infection, like a yeast infection. So burning and itching are really common symptoms. So it's a really good idea when you have those symptoms that you think might be an, an vaginal dryness to go ahead and get a culture and just make sure that it's not an infection. And so I think it's a really good idea to get screened yourself but then also to have the person that you are going to be sharing contact with to also get screened and then to wear a condom. I think when in doubt, the answer is always wear a condom because that way you can decrease the transmission of any of the sexually transmitted infections and decrease the transmission of HPV, human papillomavirus. And mm-hmm. by the way, while you're at it, it's a good idea to get a pap smear. And at the same time, we can be screening for any cervical pathology. And the screening, I have a question about yes. that, how often. Yes. So if you're just a typical woman, maybe married for 20, 30, 40 years, I mean, how often should she get screened? Is, or does this really depend upon lifestyle? Well, I think it depends on the individual, the okay. person, you know, that is in a monogamous relationship and you're sure that this is a monogamous relationship mm-hmm. may not need to get screened for sexually transmitted infections. For someone who is having intercourse with multiple individuals, mm-hmm. that's someone that may need to get screened mm-hmm. for sexually transmitted infections. Mm-hmm. So I think it really depends on the person and their relationship and who they're going to be having contact with. Mm -hmm. All right. Another great conversation today, Dr. Margaret. And I think the summary is go see your trusted healthcare provider for starters. Know that there are a lot of options out there. And yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're a condom. We're a condom. <laughs> <laughs> we're a condom. <laughs> okay, so I'm looking forward to our conversation next month for another episode of what we're calling our monthly menopause cheat sheet, Ask Dr. Margaret episode. So looking forward to that. Great. See you then. See you then. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode of Rough Talk, please do two things. First, share it with all your friends and family and subscribe to Gruff Talk wherever you listen to podcasts, including YouTube, so you never miss a single episode. Until next time, remember this, we can't control getting older, but we can control how we do it. Talk to you soon. Age Better Podcast is a proud member of the Sound Advice Network. Sound Advice, women's voices amplified.